a good storm. Yeah. But today's was. Uh huh. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> a little early. <laughs> I just need to get water. Yeah. I was about to do that. But <laughs> Is David, David coming? David's here. I'm here. David's here. Oh, I got a haircut. Here. You might not recognize He got him. his haircut. Yeah. And he's Never wearing remember. a colorful shirt. I think it was the red shirt that blew through everybody yeah. else. <laughs> How's everybody doing tonight? Well, evidently, some people are recovering from the storm. <laughs> you know, everything's all flattened. Everything's, all the grass is flattened. I mean, the grass is supposed to be tall. Well, my foxglove fell over. I heard they had to close down uh, Cliff Street in the city. Too many really? trees fell across it. Yeah. <gasps> Looked like it was rip roaring storm north of here, but we were again, we we're on the edge. Yeah. So, Catherine, well, I did get half an inch out of it. <laughs> that's what I was going to ask you, Joel. We got an inch and a half. I'm going to. Yep, I got a half an inch. <laughs> but that's. Uh, on top of the four tenths yeah. we had yesterday, where we got a whole inch, you know. <laughs> Progress. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, I guess we can get started. The are there additions or deletions to the agenda? I didn't think there would be. <laughs> Anybody who wants to address the board under privilege of the board, privilege of the floor, rather. <laughs> Ted. Yeah. Um, I'd just like to put two cents in because it's re my thoughts are, are relevant to what uh, you're talking about tonight. And I'll, I'll say this sort of matter of factly, but you, you, you're welcome to treat it as a matter of opinion. Um, I think that some of the discussions during this zoning process are losing track of their own past history. For example, on Friday night, we were talking about zones that are entitled rural character. And uh, the, the outcome of the discussion was that it was decided that uh, in a rural character zone, or it was felt, I'll, let's put it that way, that a rural character zone needed only a 50 foot uh, yard, sides, fronts, whatever, the front was even less. And I'd like to point out that on a very macro level, rural character is can, res can result from uh, average density, but on a very micro level, on, on the level of what, how your neighbor feels, you know, how you feel about what's right next door to you, it doesn't, it doesn't come from average density, it comes from how far away they are from you. And I think that the group lost, lost track of the, of, the, of the goal of rural character. It's now with, with an average, uh, with a, um, a setback, which is less than we now have in our in our low density area, um, I think we've lost track of rural character. Okay, that's my my two cents. I, I think the discussions are, are just going in a strange way. Okay, no. it was an interesting discussion for sure, and, I'm, and David will cover this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can Can I just I, the 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 term rural character is a little confusing to me. I like. I'm not, I have no, there's no meaning to that. It would be uh, good to either define it or stop using it and just talk about, you know, what, what the, you know, amenities are or the characters are explicitly that we're talking about. Right. Um, if I may respond to you, Matt, um, I, I think you make a very good point. There, there was a considerable discussion about exactly what rural character is. That's a year, a year ago. It went on for um, months, as a matter of fact. <laughs> and I don't think we ever came to any firm conclusion, although I, I, I think Rhonda would disagree with me there. Uh, I think she had a perfect example and she, she liked it. It wasn't a bad example. But I'll say that no matter what we are defining it as specifically, one characteristic that is in almost all concepts of it is the concept of open space. In other words, no, not being crowded together. And yes, I agree, it's, a, it, it's poorly defined, but guess what? We, we're talking about a zone that's called rural character and it 
has a, has now been a, sort of suggesting conditions which are anything but open space. Sure, I, and and you know, um, I, I, but let's let's talk about open space and and how to achieve that or not achieve that, and let's just use rural character as the marketing tool and and not as the legislation tool because again i don't think it has enough definition for us to to move forward with that I, one thing we learned one thing we I learned from our discussion what's that sir i thought we had renamed them from rural character one and rural character two to rural one and rural two because of that exact reason but i think that was two weeks ago yeah. right but i don't think that we intended Whatever rural character means, I don't think we intended to um, to to change that basic concept. Whatever it means, uh, just as we did not, we also did not rename the pink areas to be one thing that I, I thought made a lot of sense, called the developed zone, mm -hmm. which is the intent that it already is developed and it shouldn't be more. In fact, we are creating it as a zone, which is the target of development. Well, I, um, as somebody who's been to all the meetings and been part of these, yeah. or at least listened to some of these conversations, you know, the whole the whole notion of open space, uh, which is, you know, something that I keep talking about, and open fields, and one of the ways to get that is, and it doesn't have, as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't have to do with how far whether or not you can see the house next door, how far, how close the houses are together. Actually, you might end up with more open space if the houses are clustered in, in along a hedgerow or, or um, so then you get open, true open space, not just a visual thing. <laughs> so yeah. that's, that's once my a, opinion. Once again, I also so, agree with Leslie. So maybe was... up against the road. Yep. So yeah. anyway, that's what we're grappling with. And, and yeah. I think, a few. excuse me, I, I, I think Leslie also makes a very good point, uh, but the distinction that I'll, I'll make that differs me from what Leslie is saying is that in the long run, steady state, what she's saying is perfectly correct. But for people who are already living here and are living in, in an area that they appreciate for its openness, the idea that their neighbor might might dump something 50 feet from them it, it's sort of uh, it, it it's counter to the to the idea of this is a rural zone or a rural character if you prefer or open space zone it, it's it's not it's it's not new developments that I'm, I'm concerned about it's the effect on existing residents anyway I, I yeah I don't want to I don't want a long colloquy about this. <laughs> Uh, anybody else want to put their two cents in before we get into it? Two cents. <laughs> All right, five cents. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we're order. Okay. Um, <laughs> then think <laughs> right two dollars worth. <laughs> uh, I think we can then move on to the meat of the matter with uh, David taking the helm. Great, thanks, Joel. I put together a presentation for you all, so I'm gonna share my screen. And you let me know if there's issues with the aspect ratio or anything, if you're having trouble seeing it. So uh, here we are at the end of June. Mm -hmm. I wanted to recap kind of what's happened and where we're at. So um, I was thinking back and I think the amount of outreach that we have done is nothing short of extraordinary. We currently have 26 hours of YouTube content um, of these meetings up online uh, that people can watch um, anytime they're able to. Had uh, more than 12 Facebook reminders about this process to a group of over 300 people, um, dozens of emails, um, email us over 130 residents, two Hamlet walks that were very well attended. Um, I was tabling at the Something Special event uh, on Friday, and I plan to do that in the future. Great chance to have uh, more informal conversations with people. And we currently have a commercial use survey 
open online um, that's been shared through all of those various methods was also at the um, at the event last week uh, with paper copies and a QR code people could do it on their phone um, and I, I'm really happy with the amount of new people that are coming into the process people who haven't been involved before who are are hearing about it before it's too late to participate um, and it's great to get their voices and get um, new voices um, beyond kind of the same 20 people that are generally involved with everything. So we had a list of tasks to complete and this is that list and where we are with it. Uh, the four tasks were create sub areas within the existing low density residential zone that reflect and regulate different land conservation and development priorities in a variety of contexts. We've done that. We have agreed on four zones within the low density residential zone, um, and we've agreed to the main parameters within those zones. Um, still left to do, adopt public and private road and driveway specifications, that's not even started. Um, fix legal inconsistencies and other problems identified by past and current planners. The planning board has started working on this and is making some progress. Um, they had some small but uh, worthwhile progress at their last meeting and they are buckling down um, this month and getting some more of that work done. Um, and then finally creating a clear set of regulations and approval criteria that can be understood, followed and upheld. Um, the planning board is also working on this and I'm also working on this. And um, I thought it would be a good time to start talking about the fact that uh, what we will have done at the end of the year and what might not get done. And I think there's some pieces of cleaning up process that might not be done at the end of the year, um, but that will have the, the main changes to the actual zoning are on track, I think. Um, so our schedule for the year, quarter one is done. We passed the moratorium scoped for the zoning update. Quarter two, we had a big public meeting um, to kick off our renewed uh, focus on getting this done this year. Um, we identified the new zones and the purposes of each zone. And these last two months, we've been working on the draft zone requirements um, with a meeting every Friday, uh, two hours long, um, slogging through the details here with anybody who shows up. What we have left to do in quarter three in July, this meeting in July, we promised to present a draft of uh, what we can accomplish this year. A draft of all the zones um, in both the Hamlet and the low density residential area um, and the, the pertinent things that are connected to that. And that after that, we'll have um, plenty of time before the next meeting for people to review, to prepare comments, um, to come to the town board in August at this meeting in August and provide feedback about what still needs to change, what needs to be amended, um, what people are and aren't comfortable about. Um, and then uh, the town board can hear that, take that feedback and decide what needs to change, um, what they want uh, me and working groups to focus on going forward. Um, then the next month we'll have changes based on that direction, more feedback from the public, um, working sessions in October, um, hearing back again from the town board in November of where people are at with um, what we have ready to go so that we can hopefully get adoption in December. I do think that we are still on track for this schedule. Um, I do feel like things have been slow in the working groups. It's, a, it's hard to work through the details and it's hard um, when we have a group that's literally anybody and everybody and new people coming in every week who haven't been part of the process to keep focus on productive conversation that moves towards uh, finding agreement rather than pointing out difference. Uh, but I think we're doing it and I think it's working. Um, so there's key decisions that have been made in the different areas. Um, for the low density residential area, we've made four zones, as I discussed previously. As of last Friday, the conservation working group 
reach decisions on the most basic bulk and area parameters of all four zones. Um, so that's the green in the table that's below here. Those are the things um, that we, I believe we have agreement on. Um, we I'll still, like <laughs> we don't see green. I see pale blue and sort of purplish. Uh, then what looks like pale blue is green. Okay. And what looks purplish is yeah, kind of purpley gray. Um, so we, we've agreed and worked through some parameters for each of the zones, the lot size, um, the density, the yards, um, and what would and wouldn't have uh, site plan review. Um, we've also agreed to have a transfer of development rights program that would allow you to move development rights from one parcel to another. Um, an agreement to you to allow the use of development rights within a single building. So if you had a large lot that would give you the rights to develop four lots instead of four lots, you could build a fourplex and then preserve the rest of the land, which is uh, an effective way to um, make it easier to use those rights while also preserving more, more open space and keeping more rural character. Um, we've also come to agreement um, that we are definitely keeping some areas in the low density residential zone with basically the zoning that's there now. Uh, we still have more work to do on the parameters of exactly how transfer development rights would work, how much development rights you can transfer, what development rights in different locations are worth. You can see some of my initial proposals in the table there. Um, the concept being that um, in the places that are more important to preserve, the development rights are worth more um, and you can transfer more of them into the places that are less important to conserve. Um, we need more work on allowing commercial uses. We had a survey that we went over just the last week um, that a bunch of members of the community weighed in about what kind of commercial uses they uh, thought were reasonable and were where. I think the group was all somewhat surprised that people were open to much more commercial uses than they expected. Um, and that's something we're uh, still working on incorporating um, feedback from and deciding how, how that works. Generally, I would say people, the feedback was to be fairly flexible in what's allowed in terms of use, but be fairly strict in how it's allowed. So to have lots of strong site plan criteria for how something can fit into some of these zones, um, but, but not to be completely prohibitive of everything. Um, we have more work to do on site plan review standards and guidelines. We've decided where we want it, um, but what the actual standards are be, will be is still out there to work on. And um, I've heard that we should do more work on non-residential subdivisions. So we've had people saying, look, we've set up these standards um, to prevent residential sprawl, that's fine, but what if, shouldn't I be able to sell you know, seven acres to somebody who wants to start a farm and isn't gonna build a house on it? Um, that's something we haven't done a lot of talking about, but I've gotten feedback from a few people that is something they'd like to see included. Uh, other decisions we've made. We've agreed on the creation of three overlay zones, one for perennial streams, one for intermittent streams, and one for habitat corridors. Uh, the exact rules on these overlays we're still getting to, but the initial proposal focuses on generally um, reducing impervious surface in these areas outside of hamlets, um, allowing some inside the hamlet because it's pretty much impossible to have a hamlet otherwise. Uh, using site plan review for any new impervious surface that's unavoidable within these zones, um, having site plan review for any development that would affect them, and also possibly having a natural landscaping requirement with exemption for agricultural uses within these relatively small buffers. We've had people ask for that for the whole town. Um, I don't think that the town is going to be going there, but possibly within these buffers. Finally, in the hamlets, um, key decisions that have been made, there are two zones in the hamlets, the hamlet core and the hamlet neighborhood. 
we've decided and agreed on keeping the core small to encourage focus investment in those places. Uh, both zones we've agreed to keep very flexible for allowing and encouraging new housing investment. Um, and we've also agreed that the hamlet should be the easiest place in the town to build. Um, other key decisions, um, an agreement on allowing an increase in housing um, by right. So small new housing and small new businesses could be allowed by right um, in the Hamlet core and um, agreement. We've had reached agreement on limiting drive-throughs in the core, but allowing um, the possibility of a drive-through with strong site plan review criteria outside of the core on 96B. Um, and we've reached agreement on the zone boundaries. We spent a fair amount of time working through the boundaries and they're really driven by half mile and quarter mile radii from the key nodes in the hamlets. Uh, work we have left to do, um, I think we need more discussion of form and um, tree requirements in the hamlets. We've had a little bit, um, but we need to, to get down to finding agreement there. Um, further discussion of uh, additional flexibility for businesses in the Hamlet neighborhood zone. The initial proposal um, doesn't allow a lot of businesses except on corners and feedback we got is that there are some places that people would like to see things um, like reuse of barns um, and stuff like that in the Hamlet neighborhood. Um, what else? Oh, and also uh, I think probably we'll have some further discussion of parking placement requirements with the key question being, um, can parking be allowed in front of buildings in the Hamlet core? Um, so feedback from the board that would be helpful for me moving forward. Um, one of my big questions is what comes out of the working groups next month and how do we get out of the working groups next month? Um, my goal is that what comes out is a draft of these new zones um, and as much supporting material as possible. Um, one of my questions there is how do we get out? Um, do we need to have the group vote that they are ready for this? to come to the town board that they agree with everything in it? Um, or do we get to as much agreement as we can and bring it to the board on schedule and let people come and share any concerns they have about any particular parts of it um, and keep moving forward on, on the schedule? Um, it, it's a, a bit difficult with a co constantly changing committee uh, where it's not the same people every week and never really know who's going to show up and what the balance of voting is going to be from one meeting to the next. Uh, so I'm a little concerned if the board wants to have a vote from the working group um, saying that the draft is done. Um, I think I would prefer that if you were comfortable that we get as much agreement as we can um, and continue the process uh, because things will change from there going forward. Um, so I'm gonna read through the next part, but then pause for some conversation with you. So additional deliverables beyond what I think we have done right now. Um, you know, I think we're in a good position to have zones that can be adopted with all of their parameters, things we don't have and I don't think we will have um, is complete new road standards, uh, new subdivision standards, all of the site plan review process standards and guidelines. I think that we will have standards and guidelines. I think it's gonna take the planning board a little longer to work through a smoother site plan review process. Um, I think there's gonna be other text amendments that are gonna kind of come along throughout the process and probably after the process as well. Um, and also, this is something that I've just been reminding people of in the meeting meetings, we are setting the table. And when we're done with zoning, we're really gonna need to talk about 
planning for capital improvements, changes to road infrastructure, a strategy for recruiting businesses and recruiting development. That's all outside of this process and is not gonna be done before we adopt the zoning. So with those said, um, if I could maybe chat, hear from board members about um, getting from the working group to uh, getting a draft out of the working groups to this group um, in July. David, I have some, some questions um, about some of the slides. Uh, maybe yeah. you could answer those for me. Sure. Um, and I'll uh, try not to be too stupid in my questions here. Um, I, I, can you explain the transfer of development rights to me a little bit? Um, yeah. So the basics of transferring development rights is that your lot size entitles you to a certain number of development rights. So uh, we have been looking at, for example, in the two rural zones, uh, 10 acres is equal to one development right. So let's say you had 30 acres. You'd have a right to divide that into three lots. Uh, those lots could be 10 acres, or you could cluster and do two, two acre lots and have another uh, 26 acre lot left over. Um, you could also keep one 30 acre lot and sell two development rights. So you could sell them to somebody who wanted, uh, maybe you sell one of them to somebody who has a five acre lot and they'd really like to um, build a, a house for a relative and they don't have enough area for that, but they could buy a development right and they could add um, an additional house to their lot. Um, and in the process, they would remove that development right from your lot and those 10 acres that are associated with that right would never be developed in the future. Now, if it's worth marking, marking it, you know, one development right equals one dwelling unit in the, in the proposal. Yep. And you don't have to subdivide in order to exercise the right. So as David mentioned earlier, that same 30 acre lot could include a, you know, a three apartment building uh, and that would exercise all the development rights without having to subdivide at all. And, and how do we ensure that those are tied to the property forever? I mean, it, this is something that we file, you know, in, with the county on the deed or? Uh, yes, that's exactly, that's exactly the way. So we would um, file a note on the deed uh, or on the plat of the property, which is the surveyed map. Um, there, thereafter, anyone who did a title search um, would see that and we would see it um, whenever someone came for a, a planning board application or subdivision application. Um, that's my proposal is that that's kind of where it stops. Uh, other places have also required easements um, as kind of an extra control. That is something you could do. Um, I, I think keeping track of it on the the plats and also tracking it within the planning office as a GIS file would probably be sufficient. And, and is there a possibility that the development rights would become more valuable than the land itself? And, and you know, to that end, could somebody buy, um, you know, property with four development units on it, tear them down, and then use those to build somewhere else? I don't think that we, we haven't discussed the possibility of gaining a development right by removing a building. Yeah. Um, so I, I just, you know, I, I think about, um, my, you know, my parents lived in North Carolina near Flat Rock mm -hmm. and you know, Flat Rock became this incredibly popular, pricey place. And, you know, these outside developers from Florida and elsewhere came in and bought lots and did just that, you know, basically tore houses down in order to build, you know, differently. Um, mm -hmm. So 
so something to think about. I don't, you know, I don't think we're there. We're not flat rock. We may never be flat rock, but um, you know, I could see that I could see the development rights being, you know, at some in some case a valuable commodity, particularly if you know there are only going to be so many development rights in the town, and then you know how many are left, and um, mm -hmm. right. So. Yes, uh, one one of the interesting things there is that the development rights um, are only a control outside of the hamlets, so the hamlets don't have a limit on development rights. Sure. Yeah. 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 They're so different. Can, yeah. 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 And and so that was another one of my questions, and maybe this was sort of addressed in your bullet points, which is the last one in terms of capital improvements and economic development. It seems like the hamlets are the thing that we want to develop culturally and commercially and residentially to kind of be locuses in, you know, loci in, in the in the town for lots of different things to happen. Um, but that's only going to happen if a developer sees that as an option, you know, in a way to make money. Um, you know, and obviously there are probably ways the town can help do that, you know, if we can help them with septic and things like that. But are, are, are there concerns about what we're doing, restricting a developer too much that they wouldn't want to come in here and do anything like that? And, and how do we, how do we address, address that? Yeah, I think it definitely is a concern. Um, one thing I've actually noticed is that a large portion of the central Danby Hamlet already has zoning that's as flexible as what's been proposed. Um, and I, I don't think that anybody actually knows it, but the commercial zone as written currently allows an infinite amount of residential development. Yeah, except you um, can't do septic, so. <laughs> yeah, right. But if you, if you did shared septic or um, bound some other engineered system, the current zoning doesn't limit residential density in that, in yeah. that zone. Yeah. Um, I, I would hope I that, you know, in the future, we would think about the town developing the shared septic in partnership with a, you know, with a developer, you know, to encourage that and that somehow the town, you know, either pay, pay for that through bonding or pay for that through, you know, an assessment on the, on the properties over a long period of time, mm -hmm. um, you know, and that, but, but again, it, it sounds to me like that's a different, different Discussion than what we're doing now, and I don't want to jump the track. Yeah, and, but that is also, you know, it, some of the subject of the, the Hamlet septic grant that we are, yeah, yeah. also working on outside of this. Yeah, just, I just was concerned that you know whatever we do doesn't lock us out of that process or make it so restrictive that nobody would come in there and do that when I think it's so yes. important to us. Yeah. Right. Right, the opposite is the intent to actually to try to make it as easy as possible yeah. and increasing in, enabling the shared systems or or design alternatives to um, shared systems that would that would get us the, the density that would make a real hamlet is an, an important complement to the rezoning yeah and i i would say the hallmark of the two zones in the hamlet are that they're going to be some of the most I'd say flexible and progressive uh, zones in the county. Um, I think what I've already heard from people is, well, yeah, but you are talking about the slope of my roof or you're requiring me to have trees. Um, and my response is, yeah, there's a, there's a few important parameters that comes with the flexibility we're offering. Yeah, um, okay, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, good. Um, Matt, are you done with your questions? I, well, I have I have a couple more, but I'll I'll let you go. <laughs> well, uh, this one kind of ties into it. It's just a question about one of the uh, key decisions, um, yeah. and it has to do about rights. Um, one was one to four units and small business by right. Can you just talk a little bit more about the small business by right? Yeah. So um, my initial proposal for the Hamlet core zone was that small businesses under a thousand square feet could be built by right. And just so we're clear on what by right means, um, it means you don't have to go through site plan review or, or any other approvals by a board. Um, you still have staff review, you still have 
you know, the building code and life safety, things like that. But you don't have to go through a public hearing. Basically, you design your building, you go to the building department, they review it for compliance with the law, and you get a permit to build your building. Um, so my initial proposal was that buildings under a thousand square feet for a small uh, retail use would be allowed by that way. Um, the committee felt strongly that that was too small and asked, and I think there was strong consensus to move that to 2,000 square feet. Any discussion about- um, Is there anything in there? Sorry, Jim. It's okay. Um, uh, what, what happens when, so the building gets built in, you know, the, the store is there for two years. Is there something by right to be able to change the, um, you know, store into four different stores or is that part of this discussion at all? I think um, if something was built with, so basically you can build bigger stores uh, they just have to go through site plan review. There is a max size at 6,000 square feet um, with the purpose being we don't really want um, kind of the small box corporate chains is not the goal for the Hamlet Center Zone. Um, so we've capped the size below what they would usually be looking for, which is like eight to 10,000 square feet. Um, so the, the 2,000 square feet and under is really a uh, designed to be so small that people feel like they're totally comfortable with it. Um, smaller is really almost always better in terms of fitting in with the Hamlet context and, you know, being inoffensive. I think, you know, if you can do 600 square feet, uh, it's almost always cute, even if it's a really simple building. Um, so those, those uses would be allowed. And if someone transitioned that building to a different commercial use, um, we haven't spent a lot of time on the commercial uses um, in our conversations, but the way it is now, you wouldn't need you know, to file a change of use or to get permission to turn uh, a salon into a yoga studio or, or vice versa. They're all kind of listed as allowed uses, they're allowed in that zone, you can do any of them in that space. Does that answer your question, Jim? But discussions about this are what prompted the survey of, um, of commercial uses elsewhere, because we have, um, the feeling was, well, we, we, we agonized over whether some uses are uh, compatible with the Hamlet and, uh, and if not, then where else might they go? Which begs the question where, what uses are, are at least tolerable in the town and with no guidance in previous documentation other than the comprehensive plan saying we're not, we, know, we don't want heavy industrial um, uses or CAFOs. Um, there wasn't a whole lot there to, to provide guidance. And, and historically, the only accommodation we had for business was uh, home occupations and um, planned development zones. So there was, particularly in light of the morphing of agricultural uses into some uh, things that wouldn't have been previously considered agricultural, like the like the uh, tasting rooms and associated activities. Um, I, I asked David if we could get a, some feeling from the public about what kind of uh, businesses they would be comfortable having or hosting in their neighborhoods. Uh, and as, as David indicated, it's a surprising willingness to, to entertain um, a lot of different kinds of businesses, as long as there are strong site plan review criteria. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, it would be good, I think, you know, if we could define what um, commercial means and, and you know it's like rural character what does commercial mean you know it would be mm. good to have more you know definitions you know as to you know what we're what we're looking at you know it, you know you could think of you know any one of a number of things number of parking spaces number of employees you know uh, traffic you know in and out of the business and you know i mean all those sort of things to sort of better define what we 
we as a, as a town think a business or a commercial entity is. Um, and maybe there, maybe there are just, maybe there are standard definitions. I just don't know that. I, I, can I follow up on, on Jim's question about the, you know, the small businesses and, and you know, under a thousand square feet. Um, and maybe this is something that you would be still discussing, but um, what about like chains, you know, moving in and, you know, is there a definition for a small business, you know, could say AT&T come and set up, a, you know, a thousand square foot, you know, site in there. I mean, I, I, and I'm picking on AT&T, you know, but there are, you know, there, there, maybe there are things that don't fit into sort of the, you know, the rural character. <laughs> um, I don't know. So I, that's a great question. And uh, so far, the group hasn't really considered, um, I think what you're talking about is what some people call um, limitations on formula retail. Uh, it's a bit of a gray area in the law where sure. when you're really regulating who the business is instead of what the business is. Um, there are communities that do that, that say, you know, you can't locate here if you are a kind of business that already operates in you know, five other locations in the state, something like that. Yeah. Um, with the intention of, you know, keeping out the fast food and the other national chains. Yeah. Um, what we've done instead is really work on size. You know, even an AT&T is really not um, gonna come yeah. into a no. thousand square feet, um, you know, maybe in a very, very busy mall, but other than that, usually not. Yeah, sure. Well, I can't prevent everything that we don't like from happening either. Um, right. So um, I have I have two more questions, if that's okay. Um, one was I, I think in your first slide you called some or in the slide that had the the uh, zones you had something called high priority preservation or yes um, so. and um, you know these were these were big existing twenty five acre lots. I think if I if I owned property like that I'd be a little bit concerned, but it also seems to me like that's probably not a huge amount of people that that's impacting. Um, yeah, this is actually all publicly owned land right now. So okay. it's the state park, it's land trust land, it's town's land, um, it's county land. Uh, and we that was kind of the compromise that we came to with the group is that we would not, for lack of a better word, inflict this zone on anyone, but that private property owners who wished to opt into it would certainly be able to. And I, I'll say, and I've said it before, I would encourage them instead to go for a conservation easement, which I think is stronger and better protection. But there are some people who really like the idea of their lot being in the high priority preservation. And we have had one person volunteer to be put in. And so Rhonda's house is in this zone and anyone else who would like to be in the zone, I encourage them to reach out to me and we'll add them. Um, but other than that, for now, this is state-owned land, town-owned land, and land. So, so is the minimum lot size for that 25 acres then? The minimum <laughs> lot size for a subdivision. So you don't have to be 25 acres to go into it. You have to have 25 acres per lot if you were to subdivide in the future. Okay. Or 25, right. again, it's the average density though. So if you had 50 acres, you wouldn't have to take, create 25 acre lots. You could create a small lot um, and carve it off of it. Yeah. Right. Or, okay. And then, and then finally, I, it seems to me like in the, so in the last slide, you talked about road use and uh, it seems to me like given what we just went through with, you know, uh, the future and hollow marsh road, that yep. that's so important to, um, you know, enforcing our zoning um, in areas where it's questionable that, you know, uh, I, I guess I would hope that that would be either included or there would be a pretty, you know, fast track to getting that, that done. And, and, and I absolutely agree, uh, Matt. And I think that it might be well, it might be useful to have that, to begin that conversation here 
um, tonight. So we could take it back to the group and, 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 and go from there because the implications are pretty significant um, on the, you know, where we are now, what we've been saying is we have only one road spec and it's essentially a public road spec with a dedicated right of way, 50 feet wide, um, 20 feet paved, four foot shoulders, eight foot ditches. Um, and every development that we've done, um, development the way people usually understand it, you know, multiple lot developments where the road has been put in has been to that spec. Um, it's gotten heavier duty over time. It was originally an unpaved road spec, but it's not anymore. Um, but that spec is a pretty heavy duty one, not only in terms of the cost of construction, but also in terms of environmental impact and probably not something that we would want to uh, have as our only specification uh, in areas where we would like to encourage clustering uh, or even in the hamlets where you know smaller roads would have a lesser impact. Yeah. If you're trying to minimize the environmental impact, you would go in the op exact opposite direction. You, as I say, the road should be as narrow as possible um, to, in order to deal with the amount of traffic that it's going to be handling. Uh, we, would, we could go to something that was closer to the, the, the driveway specification for a road that services less than you know, a, a given number of units, whether it's eight or 10 or six, uh, and, then, and then require a, you know, a somewhat wider um, spec for, for road servicing more units. And I think it's in the building code, but I don't remember because uh, uh, Steve shared this before. There's a minimum spec for a road, um, which I think is 20 feet. Uh, and there's a minimum spec for a driveway, which is 12. But we can make a driveway a road if we wanted to by local regulation. Um, but, that, but the minimum stuff that's in there is already pretty heavy duty if you're going to be back from very far because it's 12 feet wide, able to support a fire apparatus year round. Uh, would turn out every 500 feet and a turn around at the end um, if it's more than 500 feet long. That's already pretty expensive and uh, probably would, you know, limit the number of people who would, who would, who would, who could in, who would want to use it. But um, it would give us more flexibility because the, 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 the desirability of clustering is is pretty strong in my mind. And in order to enable it, it to make it financially feasible, one would want to minimize both the length and the, and the width of the created roads. So if we're going to tell a landowner, and we'd rather you didn't develop the road road front, we'd rather you cluster houses over here on the edge of the field or whatever. Um, it has to be without a huge financial penalty for doing that instead of doing the easy thing, which is to put the lots where the house, where the road already exists. Uh, and that's the dilemma we faced all along, really. Is we, it, it's, and that's why we get what we've been having. Uh, and that's what's happening everywhere else around the county as well, is that the, the, the roads gradually get lined with houses because the infrastructure is already in place to support them. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's good to have, you know, several different kinds of road standards. Uh, you know, I guess I was thinking, you know, in terms of kind of the other way, which is, um, you know, uh, when a road's abandoned, what does that mean? And, you know, how do we get it off the books so somebody can't develop on it? If a road is seasonal, what does that mean? And, you know, in terms of, you know, building houses and, and the town having to, you know, upgrade a road. Or, you know, if somebody is, you know, I think, you know, we, we, we figured a workaround for this, but, you know, if somebody's, you know, doing logging in, in the wet season, you know, how do we prevent them from doing that on our roads? And um, uh, maybe that's, you know, getting too broad for this category and for this, you know, this, um, you know, this exercise and for the moratorium. But I, it seems like all those things go hand in hand in terms of, yeah, they do, um, and you know it would have been it would be nice to be able to cover the whole breadth of the situation uh, while we're thinking about it. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's already clear from what I learned from talking to Guy about the options for abandoning roads that we don't have too many roads that we could probably abandon 
uh, if we want to. Um, the reason being that you need the cooperation of the landowners who front on it in order to abandon it uh, by and large. Or um, you can abandon ro a road without everybody on it agreeing to do it, provided that, it, that the, uh, the county superintendent of highways agrees that the road is not much used. Um, that's a pretty high bar though. Um, there's a presumption, I'm trying to remember what the presumption was, but maybe you remember David, it's something like less than so many car trips per day is presumed to be little used, but I don't remember now what that number was. I think it's- so I, would, so I would argue that, you know, the Marsh Road extension and the Deputrin Hollow extension both exactly fit that criteria. You know, there, there's nobody using those that yet they're still, they're not, you know, they're, they're still considered roads. Right, nobody uses them in the winter time, but uh, they, they get a fair amount of use in the summertime. Well, not, not, not the existing roads, but you know, that Marsh Road continues past to Putrin Hollow into, you know, who, who knows where. Well, yeah, but that, but, that's, but that was abandoned a long time ago though. And, and is it abandoned? I mean, I guess that was, okay. Well, that's, yes. that, yeah, that's, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, I mean, there, there's one, one way that a road could be abandoned is if it has no use for six years running. And nobody's gonna argue that that part of the road ever has had, you know, didn't go through that period where it had nobody using it for more than six years. Yeah. So that's, that's what's called a complete abandonment. There, and then there's the conditional abandonment where, where the, by action of the, I think the conditional, back, conditional abandonment by action of the town board, um, where the adjoining property owners retain rights of access and the public retains rights of access, but the town is absolved of any responsibility for maintaining it. So that's another option. And then there's an there's a, then there's, uh, there's there's opportunity for abandonment uh, under the highway superintendent's auspices. He can declare a road abandoned if uh, either by petition for, the, for those who live on the road who, 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 who want the road to be abandoned um, or uh, looking at it from the other way around, if, if the property owners uh, accede to the, the highway superintendent's proposal that the road be abandoned. And if they're willing to go along, it could be abandoned that way and doesn't even require town board action to do it. The problem we have is the roads that are, they're town roads, you know, they're our responsibility. They see too much use to be really, to make a case for them being not much used and, and consequently uh, could be abandoned on the basis of, of that little use, yes. um, but they would be very expensive to us to deal with if somebody decided to build on them. Um, I'm thinking of things like, you know, Maple Avenue and West Danby and the Upper Reaches, Beach Hill, um, uh, yeah. uh, Bruce Hill. Um, Joel. Who's, who's that? That's me, Sarah. Oh, oh Sarah. Um, I feel like we're getting a little far away from where we're supposed yeah. to be at this meeting. I mean, I agree that the road standards are very important and I think we should be working on them in tandem with the zoning stuff. Maybe it's something that Steve and Highway can work on, but I think we should maybe address the questions that David asked us about how to get out of the working groups. <laughs> Although I know he's Sorry, he's Sarah, not I just, sharing, it just but... seemed to me like given, you know, Marsh Road that the, that the road standard you know, has an impact on zoning, but maybe the zoning- It definitely does, but I don't know if it, this meeting is yeah. the time to tackle it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, David, I have a question about the two questions that you have. Um, <laughs> um, it's about the second question. Is the second question, is it, so basically there's the, the groups that are there now, and then at the end of the month, something has to happen to them. Are they gonna be disbanded? Is it like, what, like, how do we get out of the working groups? Like, is it going to be, are they, is the process ended with them at the end of the month? And that's why we I need to figure out how to get, get out of that? I don't think that the process ends. I think those groups are going to continue to be useful. Um, it, I'm not sure that we'll, 
I'm not sure if we'll need to keep meeting every single week um, or if there'll be a way to be more pointed in the meetings. Um, but I, what I meant, I think maybe I've worded it imprecisely. What you mean is how do you get proposals out of the working groups? <laughs> yeah. How does this, this group feel about the document that my schedule has proposed you will get in July? Um, and kind of, I don't know if, if it's an assumption of mine, but you know, when I've worked with a normal working group in the past where that was a group of people selected who you knew would be really on task all the time and focused on building consensus, that you work with that group until they say it's done. And then you come to the town board. Um, because we're working with a different kind of group, a open invite to anyone in the community to come and join. Um, it's harder to, we're not gonna have everyone on the group uh, agreeing that it's done at any particular time. So my proposal, and I, I just wanted to check with you all about this is that we work as hard as we can to get as much consensus as we can get within the group. And then in July, we bring you what, what we have and where we're at, um, knowing that we do still have you know, five more months of changes coming to the document um, that we may not, well, I can say we definitely will not have everyone on the committee in total agreeance that um, the document is done. Uh, but my, my question was more of what level of support, if any, do you want from the working group for what comes to you um, do you want them to have a resolution or to, to send a list of things that they think still need work or um, I, even getting people to agree on that will be difficult. So I, expect, I suspect what will happen is I'll bring you what I've got. People will come and voice their concerns and we'll move forward from there. But because that's not kind of the most typical way of moving forward, I wanted to check with the group ahead of time and get your buy-in and feedback. I think even if there was a, you know, if there's a proposal put forth and saying, you know, this is 70% which we really want to happen. And then this other 30%, we're not quite sure about, we want to run it by the board and see what their thoughts are. And then, uh, you know, 10% of that might go back to, it might be 50% goes back from, you know, some from the first, from the proposal, but it, it could be brought, so everything doesn't have to be like, this is it, this is the way we see it, this is the way we want it, but to have them, you know, to put it out there so that it can be kicked around a little bit more and then brought back with a little more uh, feedback to them. Yeah, I see that with you. I don't think even if it were an, a, a completely appointed group, the probability we'd all come to agreement on anything is pretty slim. So, you know, if, if we could just get, we've already had a few, a few votes along the way here to sort of narrow it down to, you know, we've divided into camps and then we just sort of talk about it and it, we gradually, you know, one view becomes the prevalent one and we and we have a poll and, the, and they say, okay, well, you know, most people seem to see it this way and then we go with that. But, uh, uh, and, you know, that will result in, in the, in something that would that can be brought forth to the board, um, which is you know apart from you know Leslie and Sarah, to, um, to, you know and me, but you know, the, not everybody's been party to everything. So the possibility exists that the board will look at it and say, well, geez, that's kind of far afield from what we really would like to see. So it could end up going back. Um, but we do need you know we do need to bring something that can be bounced off of to the board. So that we can, so that we can, uh, you know, make the major decisions along the way here in a timely way. Yeah, I think we're there's a time crunch, so I don't think that there should even really be an attempt to get. Well, there should always be an attempt to get consensus, but I don't think that we're going to get close to that. But I don't know. I trust uh, David's judgment to bring something to us um, after listening to all the. Um, what everyone has to say in the meetings. And uh, yeah, I mean, we've got half a year left, right? We, got, we have to get uh, <laughs> uh -huh. 
We have to start moving, I guess. And running it through the mill takes two or three months. So we've only got two or three months, really. I, I agree with Sarah. I, you know, I think, um, you know, I, I, I trust David and, you know, that's why we hired him and, uh, you know, to put together a draft based on what he's heard from the groups uh, and then to bring it to us to review. Uh, I think that's the best way forward. Again, you know, I, I, we've talked about this before and I can never remember where we are on this, but what about planning group and CAC? You know, I certainly want their, you know, taken recommendations on the draft that David has put together. Yeah, so they will be getting it at the same time that you do. And okay. um, the way the schedule works is you're gonna get it next month and then you're gonna decide the following month with feedback from the community and those boards, what you wanna do next. Perfect, yeah, I think that's great. I, yeah, I don't think a vote is, is necessary or maybe not even appropriate because you know that's that was not the you you were soliciting information and you know trying to get the community's feel on things but i don't think that there was a you know there was supposed to be something that was voted on to push to the board to have us vote on what i do think might be helpful in addition is i mean maybe not every point of contention in whatever comes out but maybe things that are seem like larger points of contention where that could just be pointed out to us that like everything yeah. in this wasn't just like pushed to us. I mean, I've listened to most of the, the meetings and thank you for putting them on YouTube, but it's awesome. But uh, I think it, it'll be helpful to point out the major areas that were, that still seem to not be like um, set in stone or come to consensus or something like that. Sure. Yeah, I'll be happy to do that. And also, you know, some things we've moved on from with, you know, a 60-40 kind of scenario. And I, it may be useful for you to know that as well. Um, that's very helpful feedback. I really appreciate it. Um, and maybe it's a good time to move to my next slide, which I wanted to talk about um, a success that, I, that happened at our last meeting that I thought was instructive of how I want this process to continue going. Um, and you know something that I thought worked. So uh, a gentleman named Lynn who joined our meetings um, somewhat late in the process, but he found out about it and has been attending, um, sent me an email and he said, I'm par paraphrasing, but he said, I, th I think you're wrong about the way we're doing this certain thing. It was about setbacks. Um, so I think you've got it backwards. Here's why um, I propose we do this instead. And he listed specific uh, parameters for what he thought would be better. This allowed me in the next working group when we discussed this um, to say, you know, we've had some discussion about my parameters. Uh, this is why I uh, proposed it this way. Here's another proposal. Here's the reasons um, that support that. And the group, you know, discussed that and um, we kind of took a straw poll and um, found a majority consensus on something that was much closer to Lynn's proposal than to what I had proposed. And I, I think it's a, a completely reasonable proposal. Um, but what I really like about it is that it wasn't my proposal. It was uh, the process of the working with the group that came to um, that decision and it, it it's really, you know, outside of me, but the, I think the process worked. And I also think that this system of saying, uh, not just saying, I think you're wrong, because that's really easy. It's much easier to be critical than to be creative. Um, but to say, I think you're wrong, here's why, and here's an alternative. And then to go to the group and the group to say, we totally disagree with you. We think you're off base or, oh, we think there's something to that um, and uh, we'll work through it. So I, I was really happy with that. Um, and I just wanted to, to say thank you to Lynn and to highlight that this is how um, a functional group works um, and that I hope there'll be more things like this uh, as we go forward. 
And well, I, I think that's great. And I, and I think that, you know, a, a good deal of thanks goes to you because obviously you've ingrained a, a lot of trust in the people that you're working with that they can a complain about it and, and also, you know, know that you'll listen to it. And um, so it's great. Thanks. Not everybody agrees, but does Ted might want to chime in? Yeah. I, actually, what <laughs> what David just described, in fact, is a very good interaction. However, as I explained during Privilege of the Floor, basically the group had made certain decisions, well, had moved in a certain direction over a long period of time. And then one person who sh showed up on a night when very few people were present and had and completely undermined all the work that had been done in the past and this what this has been a problem uh, the last time there was a big zoning thing let's say different circumstances but the same sort of thing happened people who hadn't necessarily participated basically shot it down <clears throat> so there are two ways to look at it you know, I, I, but ultimately, it's going to be a board decision, Ted. I mean, you know, that's the idea behind going through these working groups is that the working groups put something together, and then you know, the yeah, board right, that right. But what, uh, what I'm know. saying is that the process by which they are putting things together, which are going to be forwarded to the board, is flawed. Um, we could come back there on another night with a different crew in the room. In fact, I can I can specifically give you an example. Lynn also proposed. That there should be drive-throughs in uh, on on uh, properties drive-through you know fast food drive-throughs bank drive-throughs on properties in the dense densest part of the hamlet core the next night he that, that the hamlet group met he wasn't there and it was you i think david correct me if i'm wrong unanimously rejected i think i think i probably would have been rejected with or without them there I mean, <laughs> yeah we, we, we carefully <laughs> We, we carefully weighed the proposal, and I think that was the case in both instances. Uh, if not that, you know, I don't think that this proposal would have found favor if, if it hadn't been, uh, if the group hadn't been willing to sort of re-examine the premise uh, in, 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 in making the change. And, you know, we, this, this grew out of, you know, as, as Ted said, a lengthy process. Uh, the, I proposed at one point that we have, uh, I called it a 300 foot rule, you know, that new houses be separated from existing ones by 300 feet in these zones in order to put some space between them um, and maintain some undeveloped road frontage. Well, Guy objected, um, saying that, you know, having what you do on your property being influenced by what somebody else has done, done on theirs um, or, or being constrained by, you know, by off property um, uh, actions is isn't is fundamentally unfair. That 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 uh, it should be independent of what happens. You know what happens on your property should be independent of what happens on other properties. Right. Okay. Um, the 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 logical extension of that was that having a having a a, a deep backyard, which is intended to create some separation between you and and the neighbor. Um, the discussion ended up going well. You know, it's up to you if you don't want somebody behind you to locate your lot, your house on your lot, so that if somebody decides to build behind you, they're not too close. Um, and that carried the day and resulted in the changes in the setbacks that that that, that were um, the result of Lynn's proposal. So it's it, it's an evolution in thinking, really, uh, that that has that has resulted in a modification of the proposal as we as we work on it. Right. An interesting, an interesting twist on what you were saying, Joel. You mentioned your original proposal about separating, providing a minimum distance between existing houses and new houses, and that was that was shot down. I think that the way you explained what Guy said is perfectly reasonable. However, it still remains in there for multiple houses being built on new houses being built on a new lot to keep them away from the existing houses so if you build just one house it can be close to existing houses but if you build more than one it becomes a cluster and you can't 
nevertheless, the closest, you know, why, why, should, why should the simplest one allow more flexibility for one house than, than it would for more houses? You would, you would think it might be the other way around, that more houses might require more flexibility. Yeah, the interesting, the interesting thing here is that um, what, Guy, what, what Guy suggested and proposed was that uh, we use existing law to accomplish our intended purpose. And, what, and, and what's, what's different here is that instead of, of, of saying that, you know, if you, uh, you can create lots, uh, well, let me put it differently. If you create a lot, without clustering, it would have to be at least 10 acres in, L, in, in L1 and L2. Um, if you build on an existing lot, you can build on an existing lot. If you create a new lot, anything that divides the property into two lots can be regarded as a cluster, which is kind of a peculiar way to think of cluster. If you think of cluster, you don't usually think of it as a two lot subdivision, but um, in the way Guy's thinking about it, even a two lot subdivision can be a cluster, you know, one small lot and one big lot. Mm -hmm. So you know, the provisions for the cluster subdivision and separations would apply to any, any small lot created in that zone. Yep, that's a, that's a very interesting discussion. And it's the kind of technical discussion that we really haven't had in depth in those work in those Friday groups. It's also hard to convey. Um, it, 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 I'm, I'm not going to argue with you on that, but it, putting all the myriad little pieces together of how one thing affects another, running out examples of here's what could, here's what could go right and here's what could go wrong, right, is yeah. something we haven't spent enough time on. In other words, we're, we're we're slapping things together without actually seeing what it does. Yeah, I know you have to wrap it out and then and then think about the implications and make sure you haven't created a monster. But uh... yeah, that and th I, that that that's a good way to to phrase what I, what I'm afraid of is that we could be creating a monster here. Right, we have to I be mean, careful. I agree. You know, uh, but but well, uh, we also we also have David, who I assume will not let us create a monster, and I assume that, that in the end he'll he'll be. You know whether we spend a lot of money and have guy look at it also he'll have, he'll need to um that 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 there won't be a monster created because somebody's overseeing this hodgepodge of people with varying different different points of view <laughs> so well, that's one reason we have a professional planner <laughs> right and, right you know, that's, also, why we have, that's why we pay him the big bucks the, the expectation that we're going to come out of it, this with something that is you know even you know 80 or 90 percent perfect um i think is unrealistic i think that you know we need to come out of this with something that moves us forward in the right direction because we aren't we haven't been moving forward in the right direction and i hope this board will will take that charge and 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 do that you know we'll 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 propel people in the right direction so that things can get fixed later on or tweaked or improved on um Amen to that. Yeah if, if, yeah, if I could put a humorous twist on what you just what you just said, Matt, the eighty or ninety is of course a subjective number. So using the same subjective eighty or ninety, we have existing zoning that must be eighty or ninety percent perfect too. But for some reason, we we feel it's necessary to fix it. Well, it depends on what it, it, it's not it, perfect. It, it just is. It's what's existing now. Oh, but yeah. if we're if we're trying to change what is existing now, I think if these working groups ended up in the same place where we started, we failed. That means we didn't get the input that we were looking for. So I think the fact that we are looking at different things that maybe we hadn't thought of before is incredibly good. Well, uh, I'll I'll just make the same observation I made earlier. Uh, we started with a low density, well, zone that, that we pretty much agreed wasn't a low density zone. We've now created, pardon me if I get the names wrong, I'll just use colors. We created a pink zone that is essentially identical to what we started with. And we've just created two more protected greenish zones. 
which are actually less restrictive than they than they were in the first place, in some but, measures. But we've re but we've drastically reduced the density. Again, macro versus micro. It may yeah. look good. It may look good from space, but if you're if you're actually living in it, you might not see it that way. And I'm 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 just trying to look out for the micro end of it too. What each individual will see, not what you'll see from space. Right, for sure. So I mean, we well, do need I, to. I'd like take... to I'd like to maybe wrap this up and yeah. just ask Ted that you respect the work of the group. Um, I realize that you disagree with a decision. Uh, but there's a bunch of other people who are involved in that decision. Um, and I appreciate you, you know, continuing to work with the group in good faith and understanding that we have to make decisions in the group and then we have to move on and do other things. So I, I think we can do that and continue thinking about it in the future, but acknowledge um, that the, the group has made a decision and we're, we're going to move on from that talking point for now. Oh, I, I completely understand, David. We have to move on. So, well, so David, to just just to kind of wrap absolutely. things up, are, are, did you get the information you needed from us? And it sounds like the next thing that's going to happen is we're going to see a, a draft report in some matter of yep. weeks. That's 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 correct. So okay. um, this time next month, you will have a draft. Um, and I will describe the amount of buy-in and the places that there are questions. And um, from that point, uh, so I'll give a presentation like today, but of what the actual zoning proposal is. Yeah. And um, we'll share that with the planning board and the CAC and put it out to the public. And then in August, they'll all those people will provide feedback to you. And um, from that point, you will direct me where to go from there. Do you, do so you do have you to think, do that presentation three times, or can you invite the CAC and the planning group to the presentation? And so you know, right. I I would will very much invite them, and we'll record it, and we'll put it on YouTube, and we'll email it to yeah. them, and we'll put it on Facebook, and if I have to take it to their house, <laughs> we'll do what it takes. Yeah. So from the point where we get the presentation at our I don't know, whichever meeting in July, do you mean the zoning meeting in July? Yep. Okay, um, between then and August, the August meeting is when we should be getting feedback. Are you, so are you expecting us to have a direction to go from that meeting? So does that mean we should be trying to come up with potential changes or comments in between or is it, or would that be after the August meeting? What I really expect from you at the August meeting is um, kind of topics to focus on, not necessarily like change this parameter to that number, but work, you know, I would like you to tell me where you're comfortable is done, if any, um, and where more work is needed. Um, and, you know, if you have a sense of the direction that would be helpful, you know, if you want to say, you know, this zone needs to be more restrictive, go and then come back, that would be helpful. Um, I'm just thinking that we might all have our own like individual opinions, but then come August when we have public feedback, then yep. who knows what happens, you know? Yeah. So yeah. As long as there's some cushion for after that, that we don't have to come up with everything at that meeting. That Absolutely. That yep. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully we'll get enough public feedback that we'll, that we'll be able to identify the problem areas and could say you know, this needs to go back to the back for more work. So what I have up on the screen and I'll, I'll put this on um, the planning working group page as well is just a set of things for you to get um, more involved if you'd like. There's the commercial uses survey that's about what different commercial uses. It's a huge matrix uh, uses outside the Hamlet um, if they should be allowed. Anywhere, nowhere, near 96B or on smaller roads. And then if they, what level of site plan review they should have heavy, medium, staff only or none. Um, and that uh, is kind of the feedback that I told you we were a little surprised by how much people were open to. Um, there's the playlist of that 26 hours of footage of meetings. If you um, 
you could get through it all in a day if you didn't have to sleep in a couple hours. Mm -hmm. um, the Hamlet Working Group page and the Conservation Working Group page, which is where all the drafts are going as they come out. And then um, I thought I'd throw in a link to our existing um, zoning and subdivision regs. If you aren't totally familiar with those, you can check them out. Can we feature this prominently and, and on the uh, front page of the website? Sure. The front page of the website is getting a little crowded. We've got a bunch of the survey and um, all of these links are actually there now, except the existing documents page. Do you mean this slide or the whole presentation? Not, not the whole presentation, just the, um, you know, the resources to say, you know, yep. here's, here's yeah. make it easy to plug in, click these links. <laughs> sure. Yep. So what I have up there now is the email sign up list, the commercial survey, and then the Hamlet and conservation working group pages are all linked on the, the landing page. Um, but I could add the YouTube link and the existing documents if you'd like. Sure. Okay. Uh, we'll do that tomorrow. And maybe on the, on, the, on the home page, you could have just a link to key resources or something. Sure. Yeah, which would take you to that planning page. And sometime soon we'll have a new website, right? Right. Good yeah. All right. Excellent. I appreciate all your feedback. We'll keep it moving forward. Yes. Was there anything else hey, for David. tonight? Nope. Right. 8.30. I think we're done. A reasonable amount of time. Yep. Thanks, Thank folks. you. Thanks, David. Thank you. Night, all.